Good evening. <laughs> Welcomes you to day one, session two of Freedom Song, our Independence Weekend special. This session, titled Winged Stallions and Wicked Mares, is a unique history of horses in the Indian subcontinent that explains why the animal has such a special place in our mythology. The author, Dr. Wendy Doniger, is an Indologist whose professional career has spanned five decades. She has written several acclaimed and best-selling works, notable among which are the Hindus and Alternative History, Hindu Myths, a source book, The Origins of Evil in Hindu Mythology, among others. She has also translated the Rig Veda and the Kama Sutra. She is Professor Emerita of the History of Religions at the University of Chicago and has also taught at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London and the University of California, Berkeley. She will be in conversation today with Obit Chanda, a best-selling author, columnist, and entrepreneur. His books include a novel, Anchor, a business book, From Command to Empathy, and a historical biography, Dara Shuko, The Man Who Would Be King. A very warm welcome to all of you and to our audience. Avik, all yours. Great. Um, Shukana, thanks very much. And a very warm welcome to all our viewers who've been able to join us. And a huge welcome to Wendy. It's such a pleasure. It's such a privilege to be talking to you again, Wendy. My pleasure. Welcome. Um, so today we're going to be talking about your new book, which is Wing Stallions and Wicked Mares. And just going through the, you know, through the press notices and, and blurbs, one of the things that I came across, one of the items was uh, Ariel Kluklish of, of Georgetown University, right? And he has called this book and I quote, a work of love by a scholar who has spent most of her life in psychic connection with horses, unquote. So that, that might well be the case, but speaking from the benefit of having read your memoir, uh, The Donegal's Great Neck, as well as multiple different conversations that we've had in the, over the past few months, my sense is over and above the psychic connection, which might well exist, the the love is of a far more palpable, maybe sort of tactile nature, right? The, the lived in experience of growing up in your adults and years and having a stable, uh, was it the Ganesha stables, if, if I'm not mistaken? Was that the name? Yes. Uh, and, and the very fact, the very fact that you've dedicated this entire book, this wonderful book, not to co-authors or students, but to all the horses that you've loved and cared for and ridden at different points of time in your life. And I was wondering, right, um, how has this, it's not, it's, it's way more than seeing things through just the prism of, of a mythologist or a historian. It's that love, it's that empathy with the subject. How has that shaped the, the making of your book? Well, it's, 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 it made me want to write the book. Um, it made me, um, notice horses whenever i read anything um including things about india i'd always notice the stories that had horses in them and so forth the way certain you know how your name drop, jumps out of a page you say of you say oh, you know that so horse the word horse always jumped out at me and um my own love of horses my my one of the horses that i dedicated the book to this is my old friend uh, babur um my, my great arabian horse i think there you go there you can see so when you really know about horses, then when you read stories about horses in Sanskrit texts and translations from Tamil and so forth, you can tell the difference between the stories that are told by people who really have horses and people who don't have horses. So in India, most people never had horses. Um, mm -hmm. Horses are very difficult to keep in India because of the monsoon and the hot season, there's not much time for grazing. So people had to keep importing horses. If you had a horse, you couldn't just keep it forever and ride it. You had to keep bringing in horses and it was expensive to import horses. Um, some came over the Northwest passes and some came by ship, but they were always, um, it was always a privilege to have horses as opposed to the horses of Europe or the western part of the United States where anyone who had any money at all had a horse to help him on the farm and so forth. So when I read Indian texts, when I read the Rig Veda, 
when I read the Mahabharata, you know these are people who know about horses. The way they describe the horses, um, they 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 bring out qualities that I know from my knowledge of horses. But when you read some stories from parts of Tamil Nadu, for instance, where they never had horses, the stories are very different. For instance, there's a story where uh, some magical horses devour all the other horses in the stables and their mouths are coated with blood. Well, if you know horses, you know, if you get bitten by a horse, you know you've been bitten. It's not nice, but it's not, you don't get really badly hurt by, a, it's not like getting bitten by a dog even. You don't want to be kicked by a horse. It's the hindquarters of the horse that you stay away from if you have a horse you don't trust. So these stories from Tamil Nadu where the horses bite people and they eat them up are stories by people who never had horses. They're quite different from the Rajasthan stories where they grew up with horses and knew horses and, and loved horses. Um, there's also a quality in some of the, again, South Indian stories, which are very cruel horses. They tame the horses with a bit that has razors in it, and they saddle the horse with a saddle that has razors in it. And it's a fantasy of cruelty, which is not part of any of the rest of the Indian stories told by those people who really did have horses. So you know the difference between them. And then you see also statues of horses, some of which are beautiful. I mean, paintings of the Mughal paintings of horses and the statues of horses are so lovely. But then you get a lot of folk paintings of horses where they look like big dogs. They really don't look like horses at all. And you know, these are people who still want to do a painting of a horse or a statue of a horse. They love horses. Horses are important to them, but as far away animals, animals that other people have, animals that you admire, people that you admire, perhaps people that you fear. The tax collector who came into a village and took away almost all of your crop, left you very little to live on for the year. He rode a horse. That's, that's mm -hmm. when you saw a horse in many of the villages of India. And yet what fascinated me was the people to whom this happened, who only saw that horse, the tax collector's horse, worshipped horses, put horses on graves, made little statues of horses, and loved them, and yet didn't know them. And that to me was the great paradox of the history of the um, horse in India and of the mythology of the horse, the way people thought of horses, which was in many cases so different from what real horses are like. And so it was that contrast between the horse, the Rig Veda, the Mahabharata with the real horses, and then some of the stories up in Assam or down in Tamil Nadu places where um, the horses were not known, where they were still loved, but loved in, in a less knowing way, and sometimes a less affectionate way. Mm -hmm. so, that was a difference. Indeed. And, and you talked about the, the Raman Mahabharata and also the Vedic text, but particularly when we're talking about the Vedic times, the I think the central motif or one of the, the main myths, indeed practices, would be that of the horse sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And you've dealt with this in, in great detail in your book. And it'll be great for the readers to learn how did this come about in the first place? And over time, how did it segue into different kinds of variations in, you know, in the in the latter day myths and tales? Yeah, it's a really interesting yeah. question. So the sacrifice of a horse is part of a probably pre-Vedic tradition, it has Indo-European connections um, with sacrifices of horses to Poseidon in the Greek world and so forth. But the great texts are, of course, the Vedic texts, and the horse sacrifice was something which gave um, political power to the king and also the power of fertility to the king. So in the early Vedic period, that was what it was. The horse was, was smothered, suffocated, and then divided up into pieces. Um, later on, it developed in the Brahmanas around 900 BCE. Uh, the fertility aspect of it came out so that after the horse was killed, the queen, the chief queen of the king, would lie down beside the horse and the powers of the horse would go through her into the king 
and the king would then have a, a son. That was uh, when the king wanted a son, he would perform a horse sacrifice. But the real purpose of the horse sacrifice was political. Because before you killed the horse, you let him go free for a year. And wherever he wandered, those lands were claimed by the king. But horses don't wander. If you have a horse kept in a stable, he comes back at night to be fed. So in order to make this stallion, quote, wander, the king had an army who drove the horse precisely where he would like to aggrandize some lands, add some lands to his, um, to his kingdom. And when the, the horse would go there, going into foreign lands and some farmer would say, hey, get your horse out of my field and over the hill, a thousand armed men and the farmer would say, fine, fine, your horse can go in my field, go ahead. And at the end of that year of quote, wandering, the king would have enlarged his kingdom. So the text all say, you have to be a very powerful king to perform a horse sacrifice. In the Mahabharata, with the 18 books of the Mahabharata, book 14, after everything has happened, after 14 books of war have taken place, then uh, uh, Yudhishthira performs the horse sacrifice. So it became a bravado way for a king to demonstrate his power and to increase his power far beyond the religious meaning it had originally had in the Rig Veda as a sacrifice. A sacrifice simply means you give up the most precious thing you have to the gods in the hope that they will give you in return whatever you want, long life, healthy children, or conquest in battle, which was a great concern of the, Ved of the Vedic Indians. So it had many different meanings over the years. It had fertility meanings, it had political meanings, and it always kept its basic religious meaning, which is that you offer the gods the most precious thing you have, in the hope the gods will give you back all the many things that you want. And so it became very symbolic in later, in later centuries. Mm -hmm. and, and you also talked about the ritual um, of the horse race, right? So after the big Vijaya, the, the stallion which wins and which is about to be sacrificed, before that, there is this ceremony. And I call it a ritual because for all practical purposes, the race would be fixed. It wouldn't be a proper race with every horse giving a, a you know, getting a free charge. I think one of the, earliest, the earliest recorded stories I know of an illegal horse race, a fixed horse race. As, as long as there have been horse races, there have been illegal horse races. No one could ever apparently resist monkeying with the results. And so it just happened that the horse that was going to be sacrificed always won the race. Um, and I think, I think that's a historic first of, um, of illegal horse racing. And then, and then afterwards he was, he, he was sacrificed. So yes. Uh, horse racing has always had a bad name, I'm afraid. Um, and in your book, you've also explored other cultures where you had a horse as an emblem, mostly an emblem of, of, of purity or of martyrdom. And I'm thinking specifically of what the Shias ascribe to, particularly during the Muharram. And on the 10th day of Muharram, yeah. there is a procession of the the winged horse, you know, the fabled horse of Karbala, Hussein's horse. Um, and, you know, it's, its mane and its body is treated with red paint to symbolize the blood that was spilled because, uh, you know, so Jenna comes back from the battlefield alone, you know, inconsolable, riderless, because Hussein has been slain in battle. And I was wondering whether you see any parallels between the horse myths in, in the Hindu texts and that in other cultures, for example, in India. It's yeah. a good question. And of course, um, the, the, uh, the um, Muharram is celebrated by Muslims in India as well. And in parts of India to this day, um, there, there are festivals with the horse, um, streaked with red paint representing his blood, and poems are sung to him. So the, the horse of Karbala is also um, an Indian horse. It's it's a Muslim Indian horse rather than a Hindu Indian horse. And because um, it's part of India, it resonates with another probably much older non-Hindu horse tradition, 
which is that of Buddhism. I think the closest thing to the winged horse, the horse of um, uh, the Muharram horse, the horse of um, the uh, Hussein, is the horse of the Bodhisattva. Um, the, the winged horse of Hussein also weeps. He weeps in sympathy um, because Hussein has, has been killed. And the, quite a lot is made of that weeping. And in the Buddha Charita, and in later uh, versions of the story of how the Bodhisattva became the Buddha, how he escaped at night from the palace on his horse, and the gods came down and cupped their hands under the hooves of the horse so that no one would hear the, the, the noise as he left the palace. When uh, the Bodhisattva finally turns away and says goodbye forever, the horse weeps. And there aren't a lot of weeping horses in uh, the, the Rajput tradition, in the Vedic traditions. Um, it comes in in Buddhism in an interesting way, and it comes in in Islam in an interesting way. So the, the weeping horse, the sympathetic horse is there. In some of the Rajput epics, which are heavily influenced by Islam, they're, they're fighting against um, the Mughals and the Delhi Sultans, but they're also fighting with them. There are stories of Hindu kings whose best friends are Muslim horsemen and they ride together. There's a lot of intermarriage and a lot of interaction. Um, those horses also sometimes weep, like, like the horse of, of Hussein. Um, and also one of the changes that comes in under the influence again, of the Arab presence in India from even before the, the Delhi Sultanate, is that the Hindus from the Vedic period on always preferred stallions. There's all this macho imagery of the stallion, the fertility, the, rich, the virility, and all of that sort of thing. And the mares, we'll talk about the mares later, the mares get a bad press, but the um, Arabs like mares. They rode mares into battle, they found them more loyal and more intelligent in various ways. And in the later parts of the Rajput epic, the heroes ride mares. They start riding, they get magical mares, an old woman magically gives the mare, the mare comes out of the sea, the mare is imported. There's all sorts of stories about those mares. But you begin to get a positive attitude toward mares in these stories. And that along with the weeping horse, is, I think, a, an Arab contribution to the mythology of horses in, in India in general. And I, was, I was thinking uh, when you talked about the weeping horse in an Islamic tradition as well as in, in the Buddhist texts and contrasting that with what we have in the Rajput texts, for example, Prithviraj Raso or the, or the latter day texts, um, you know, expounding the, the valor and, and courage and bravery of. Rana Pratap Singh and, and, and other kings, right? What possibly has to do with the archetypes, because in the classic Rajput archetypes, a Rajput does not weep, right? He will keep his word, he will die defending his honor. Rajput women do not weep. They will wait for the husband's corpse to be delivered so that they can commit sati. Right. So maybe that has those those archetypes and those very sort of firm traditions of Raj might be might have something to do with you know you know sweeping horses or weeping men and women considered okay. more unseemly. The horse, the horse expresses what the human cannot. There are things that human beings are not allowed to do, but their animals are allowed to do. I think that's absolutely true. I think that's what's happening in some ways. And then, of course, you just listen to other cultures. The, you, the stories are retold. There are, um, in South India, there are um, Ravutans. There are, um, in, in, in Hindu temples, there are images called Ravutan, which is the um, um, Muslim word for a, a horseback rider. And those horses are worshipped by Hindus. So there's a whole lot of interaction that comes in the horse world, uh, positive interaction, even in those epics, those Rajasthan epics, which are about how the Rajputs are defending India against the Muslim invaders. It's a martial opposition and still mm -hmm. the friendships, the cultural uh, borrowings are very vivid there, are very interesting there. Yes. 
Wendy, I want to take you back to something that you started off the discussion saying, you know, just when you read horse related myths or texts, it's very easy to figure out whether those people have any practical knowledge of horses or not, right? And specifically when one is talking about animal husbandry, oh, yes. um, the literature is absolutely prodigious. I mean, you have the Ashva Shastra, which you've dealt with at, at some great detail, but surprisingly, and, and this was news to me, um, you also have passages in the Arth Shastra, which talk about animal husbandry and how it should be trained and cared for and how it should be fed. And in both of these texts, as well as in others, there is this continual refrain of, of, of ghee, the mention of ghee, that either it should be an integral part of the horse's diet or the, the, the food, the fodder, should actually be mixed in ghee and, and offered to the horse, right? And, and of course, that's, that's not going to be very beneficial to the steed over a longer term, for sure. Yeah. And and I was wondering uh, why that's the case. The the first one is the of course the the no brainer, the the obvious one that the author and you know the the surroundings of that author, the the milieu in which the author lived and worked and had absolutely no practical knowledge of taking care of horses. Yeah. But could it also be that that these authors are looking at the horse as this? venerated in some some instances deified creature on a pedestal on the one hand and therefore in order to have a worthy offering you, you can only have something which is equally sort of pristine and pure and sacred ergo key does that make sense yes it's, it's, it's a complicated question in a very interesting way first of all the artist shastra which is much earlier than any of the Ashva Shastra. So the Arda Shastra is Kautilya's book about how to run a country. It's about government. And the Ashva Shastra, um, five or six, seven hundred years later, is a book about how to, how to treat horses. So Kautilya's book is much more practical. It's very realistic. It has details about how to build a stable and all sorts of things. It has a very nice passage where it says there should be a place in the middle for horses to roll. So that, that's a moment where you know this guy knew horses. This is an example of how you say, if you know horses, you know how they love to roll. Especially after you've ridden them when they get the saddle off their back, they just go like that. So, so it's it, the, the art of Shasta, the, the political book has a lot of very practical knowledge about horses and does not tell you to feed the horses key. The Ashwa Shastras, which are much more mythological. What color is the best horse? Where should you have a whirl of hair to make it lucky or not? There's a lot more magic and religion in the Ashwa Shastra, and that's where you begin to get the magical things, uh, such as ghee. Um, where you get the real um, discussions of ghee is in the European criticism of, of um, Indians uh, taking care of horses. Um, and that I think is prejudiced in some way. You know, you said how ghee is not good for horses. Um, there's a joke in Shakespeare where, where a guy is really stupid. And they say, you know how stupid he is? He puts butter on his horse's hay. That's sort of the stupidest thing that Shakespeare could imagine anyone doing. So the Europeans, starting with Marco Polo, um, went to say, look how stupid the Indians are. They their horses ghee. And I think a lot of that was bullshit. I, thought, I think a lot of that was just prejudice, anti-Indian ideas. They're trying to explain why horses don't do well in India, why they don't thrive in India. And they say, well, they give them ghee. So I think you're right that it may have had a ceremonial value because a horse is sacred, we give it ghee. But that would just be a little bit and on special occasions. Whereas in general, I think the person, I think Indians knew very well that you eat a lot of butter to horses. And I don't think they fed them a lot of butter. Um, they fed them what they could. And the trouble is you can't get good hay in India because you can't get good grass in India because of the monsoon and, and the hot and the hot time. There were one or two places where you can, up in the Punjab and some of the highlands of central India, and um, indeed to this day, some of the best grazing lands in the South Asian subcontinent are in Pakistan um, and not in India. 
So I think the key was partly ceremonial, partly more religious than practical, and partly more that was situated by European prejudice against Indians. Look at these people. They need us to govern their country. They can't even feed their horses properly and all that of that nonsense. So the gee, the gee accusation to me is very suspicious. I wonder about it. And I've never known an Indian horseman that fed ghee to his horse. We talked a lot about the, the European prejudice towards animal husbandry as was practiced in medieval times in India. Um, there, is, there is a clear prejudice as well that, that comes out through your reading of the text and that's embedded in in the title of the book itself, which is Winged Stallions and Wicked Mares. So whenever you're talking about the stallions, right, there are these sentient, noble, anthropomorphized creatures that weep at, you know, the, the departure of the favored prince as he takes sannyas and, and then later on becomes the Buddha, or it is this absolutely dazzling, lambent white steed of, of the future avatar of Vishnu, the Kalki avatar, right? Or you have this, you know, rearing, you know, bulent horse on a stride which there is a deity and that is a variant of Shiva, right? One of the, the rare examples you talked about from a yeah. temple yeah. in South India. Now, all of these are, are stallions. All of these are male and all of these are noble. As, as opposed to that, in sharp contrast to that, many of the tales, a large majority of the tales, the, the mare is portrayed as, as a sorceress, as, you know, up to no good, all kinds of magic and trickery and or a fan fatale leading the, the male, you know, the either a stallion or men or gods away from the, the part of the writers. How do you read this? I think it's a general misogyny of classical Hindu culture. Um, the stallion is the male, that's the good one. You begin it, it begins in the Rig Veda, everything begins in the Rig Veda, it, um, with, the, with the myth of Saranyu, who's later called Sanya, um, who is the daughter of Twashtar. Twashtar is, is the artisan of the god, Hephaestus. He's the one who makes things. And she's married to Surya, uh, the sun god. And the sun um, is regarded in the Rig Veda as mortal. He dies every night and is reborn in the morning, and he dies at the end of the year and is reborn in the spring. And he's married to Saranyu, who is immortal. She's the daughter of the artisan of the gods. And there are many. This is a popular story. It's retold to this day. Uh, Kira Narayan is busy still collecting versions of this story in the, in the Himalayan region. She doesn't like him. He's too, uh, sometimes it says he's too hot because he's the sun. Sometimes he's mortal and she's immortal. She runs away from him. And in order to run away from him, she takes the form of a mayor. Now, the idea of fleeing from um, an unwanted sexual partner in the form of a mare is part of yet another Vedic story, which is most famously told in the Brihadaranika Upanishad, which is the story of primeval incest. That Prajapati wanted to mate with his daughter. He was all alone. He created something from himself so that there was a second one. This is the beginning of time. It was his daughter. He tried to mate with her. She ran away in the form of a horse, of a mare. He became a stallion and covered her, and that's how horses were born. She then took the form of a cow. He became a bull and covered her, and that's how cows were born. And the Upanishad says, and so it went right down to the ants. So that's another big and important Vedic myth. So in the Saranyu story, she only becomes a mare. He covers her and she gives birth to the Ashwins, who are twin gods, who are half horse, half uh, human, mortal, but actually not immortal. And they are Indo European gods. We know them from the Dioscuri, the Greek twin gods, uh, Castor and Pollux. So that's a very old story. That is to say, it's a story that was known before the Indo-European people even got to India. It was shared with the Greeks and Romans. So it's an old, old story 
um, about the birth of the Ashwin. And in order to flee from the son, she has abandoned the child she had originally had with the son, who is Manu, the ancestor of the human race. In fact, she took a fake copy of herself in her place, and the son couldn't tell the difference, and he begot upon this fake, this, this pseudo Saranyu, Manu, who is the ancestor of all of us human beings, or all Manavas, or all human people. So it means that the mother of all of us was a fake, and she was a fake because our real mother abandoned us and ran off um, um, the, the earliest divorce in, in Indo-European history, really. So that's a big story. It's told in all the Puranic texts, and it's a story of a bad mayor. And that's the source, I think, of all the other stories of bad mares, the Buddhist stories of the Ashwamukhis, the, the horse-headed um, yakshis, yakus, yakshinis, um, who um, uh, uh, seduce men because they're very beautiful, and then they eat them, they kill them, and they eat them, and so forth. So you have a real old Indo-European and then Vedic tradition and then Mahabharata Purana tradition that's into the folk tales that, as I say, um, Kira Narayan is collecting to this day about the bad mayor, the bad mother um, who abandons her children and runs away. And there's that prejudice which colors all of the early Sanskrit literature until the Arabs come in with their mares. And then you begin to get a counterculture of, uh, of loving mares, intelligent mares, sensitive mares, brave mares, um, and all those other uh, those other nice things. Um, nowadays, in weddings, um, people prefer to ride the bridegroom ride a horse to the wedding. Um, usually, by preference, it's a Mariari horse, and by preference, it's a mare. Um, that's that's part of the positive mare tradition that escaped Vedic shadow. Going back to um, the, the Rajput traditions, and if you're going from the page, from the written page, with, with the preference of the stallion over the mare, to horses being used as cavalry in the field of battle, the Rajputs did prefer stallions, uh, did they not? In, in stark contrast with as you mentioned, the Arabs, the Turks, later on the Mongols or the Mughals, yep. all of whom preferred mares. Yep. And then after their wake, so I'm looking at, you know, two or three or X number of centuries where the Rajputs rode the land before the Muslim invasion, with stallions fighting yep. amongst each other, and then Absolutely. they're fighting the, the Muslims who are riding mares. Yep. And another two or three centuries pass, and now you've got the East India Company, and they're fighting against the incumbents, the Mughals, and they prefer the stallions. They do. Again, right. So what what accounts for this you know, change in you know, a stallion over mares, mares over stallions and stallions again? Well, there are partly <laughs> rational mythological preferences, and there are also partly um, practical preferences. Um, the British at first tried to import thoroughbreds. Uh, they imported various other horses. They imported uh, whalers. Um, from uh, New South Wales in Australia. They imported uh, horses uh, from the Cape horses from South Africa and so forth. They're trying to get horses into the cavalry. Um, and generally speaking, there's a, there's a British expression, which I think is largely true, which is a good big horse will beat a good little horse. So for cavalry, we wanted large horses. The Arabian horses, which are, in my humble opinion, the very best horses in the world, um, are not as big as the whalers were, or the Cape horses, or the thoroughbreds. So the British tried to bring in their, their own horses to some extent. That importing them from England was not practical. They, they finally ended up stop. They stopped trying that after a while. But they did bring in their horses from um, New South Wales and originally from. Um, uh, South Africa, and they preferred the larger horses. The stallions were larger; um, they were they were bigger. Um, in some ways, they were faster. Uh, they could carry heavier weight, and so forth. So there there are some practical reasons um, 
for wanting stallions, but I think it's largely mythology. They're soldiers, they're macho types, they're boys. They're all being boys together. And mm -hmm. they wanted their horses to be boys too. Um, in general, in horse racing to this day, most of the um, great winning horses are stallions. They are faster than theirs. You very occasionally get a, a mare that'll be that'll be the stallion, and so that that was the criterion, and that's what they had. You talked about you know big strong horses uh, beating the the little ones, yeah. and and yet there's this one exception where you talk about the polo horses in, in Manipur, oh. which are pretty quite tiny, cute yeah. creatures, and and yet very effective. Tell us tell us about. Well, the word beating is perhaps a too vague a word to use. I think um, that was generally speaking a reference to horse racing. In a race, a big horse will beat the little heel. But in a polo game or in all sorts of other things, a clever horse, a quick horse, um, a maneuverable horse, a sensitive horse will beat a big stupid horse. And so I think the intelligence of Arabs and of other uh, native Indian breeds, which is the Marwari and the Mimikiri horse, um, littler horses are good for a lot of things. Um, even the Mughals, who are very fond of uh, Arabians for obvious reasons, and, and the British also, who really like them, even they, even the Mughals and the British, preferred nape smaller native Indian breeds to thoroughbreds for things like w working up in the hills, um, carrying burdens up into the hills, and then maneuvering in polo games. Polo is very important um, in India from even before the Mughals and, and on that. So there are many other things besides fighting in battles and winning in races that you can do with horses. And most of them, in my humble opinion, you do better with mares. Um, but um, so the question is, what are you doing? So the great polo horses have often been been mares or and or have been of the smaller breeds of the Arabians and the Marwari and the Kachawari um, and the Manipuri horses. They're, they're, they're quick to the leg, they're quick to the hand. Um, they can think for themselves. They know where the ball is. They, they don't even need a signal from the rider where to go. The horse can practically play the game for you um, if it's a clever enough horse. Um, Roger Kipling wrote a wonderful story about native Indian horses called the Maltese, the Maltese cat. So there was a horse named the Maltese cat, although it was a horse, it was a native horse. And it's about a polo game played between the native Indian team and the British team. And from the start, you're on the, you're on the side of the native Indian team. And the story is told by the horses. It's told by the Maltese cat who is the leading horse on the native horses that are fighting against the British cavalry. And they're smart and they're brave and they win. And you're very glad that they win. Um, it's a wonderful story. And it's a great story about many ways in which the smaller, more intelligent native breeds and the smaller and more intelligent mares are superior to the big macho stallion and the big macho thoroughbreds and the big macho British. Indeed. Uh, we talked about, you know, prejudice and, and discrimination. We were talking about the, the genders, the stallions and the mares. But what the, the texts also give us is the discrimination, the costs, just like we have the Varna system where human beings are divided. The same is mirrored in the case of horses as well. Tell, tell us about Yes. That. Well, there's two things. First of all, there's the way that the Indians themselves invented the caste system and applied it also to horses. So there were Brahmin horses and Kshatriya horses and so forth. There were uh, Varnas of horses, and there were also Varnas of horses in the sense that there were colors of horses. Varna originally actually means color, white horses and black horses and horses with spots here and horses with spots there and all of that. But there were also types of horses, and they were um, classified in those ways. What I wrote about more in the chapter on the British was the 
the way that the whole idea of breeding and the breed of horses, which is there in India too, among the ways that you distinguish horses in the Ashwa Shastra is the horse's kula. Well, kula is the word used for a family and the, the lineage. The lineage, the clan. The lineage of the clan, the gotra, uh, what it is yes. for human beings. Yes. And when you are um, going in the power of caste thinking, it's very important to know um, the gotra of anybody you meet. Um, who was your father is the first question you ask, you need to know. And in in Indian and in British racism too, who is the father? That's the whole idea of race and of breed and of all the basis of those forms of human prejudice. So my argument is that it's true of horses and also of dogs, that if you want to know what kind of a horse this is, a really good and intelligent question to ask is who is his sire, who is his dam? If you know that both of his parents are thoroughbred, you know something about how big he's going to be. If you see a colt, you know how big he's likely to be, and so forth. Um, the the foals that come from Arabian horses are one way, and the foals that come from Katyawari horses are another way. So if you're in the world of the breeding of horses, it makes sense to say, I need to know the lineage of this creature in order to know anything at all about it. You don't just say, who is that horse? You say, where does it come from? And I'm arguing that people who think that way and are in the habit of talking about something like a thoroughbred, and the whole idea of a thoroughbred, pure bread, all the words, which are racist words, it enforces racist human attitudes too. A world in which you want to know the pedigree of your horses and your dogs is a world in which you don't like people of some lineages as much as other lineages. And I think it enforced caste ideas in the Hindus and racist ideas in the British. And it was just a, a problem um, that um, made in Europe, for instance, ideas of selective breeding and sterilization of idiots. I mean, it leads into all sorts of bad places when you place too much emphasis on paternity and so forth. So that was a problem with, with horse breeding cultures, but I think it enforced, didn't invent, but it enforced racist ideas, I think, and that was a problem um, in the Hindu world, and it was a problem in the British world. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to, to the caste system, the varna of the horses, uh, if, if memory serves me right, there's one passage where I think you say that depending on who's writing or who's authoring or, or who's the patron of that particular text, if it's a Brahmin, then you have the Brahmin not just on top, but with attributes of the highest quality. Whereas if that particular text passes under the supervision of, of Kshatriya Raja, then you have the Kshatriya who has all of these graces and, and valor, whereas in that same text, the, by, in contrast, the Brahmin one would be a little bit more indolent or you know, apathetic, etc. And I thought that was very, very interesting, the, the dynamics, depending on who's telling the story of the, of the Varnas as well, right? Not only that, but I mean, Sanskrit texts were written by Brahmins, and yet the Ashwashastra, which must have been written by a Brahmin, ranks Brahmin horses as, as basically cowardly and stupid and no good, and the Kshatriya horses are the best Varna, even in that text, which theoretically at some point had, had a Brahmin uh, off. The Brahmin horses are not good horses, according to the Ashwa Shastra. The Kshatriya horses are the ones you really want to have. So. Yes, <laughs> which, which one found very, very interesting there. Oh, uh, yes. So. We all know that you know the the horse is not indigenous to to India, and and you talked a little bit about this about the, the imports over the ages. And I was thinking if we draw two sort of parallel narratives. So on the one hand, we have the Indo Ari uh, sorry Indo Europeans or the Indo European speakers, the earliest settlers, and then we have perhaps the the Greeks, the the Bactrians, Scythians, Parthians, and then we have successive 
waves of Muslim invaders, and of course, finally, the Europeans, the British. If no, you no, take all of them... No Muslim invaders. I mean, no people who brought horses and they brought them in, traders brought them in, people. Horses came in long before uh, the Delhi sultans came as conquerors. Arabs were in India, as traders and as people. Arabian horses were uh, imported into India for many centuries, even before the Delhi Sultan, let alone uh, the, the Mughal rulers. So it wasn't just invasions, it was also tradespeople mm -hmm. and, and people who wanted them and all those horses. So, sorry, go ahead, go on with your question. <laughs> so, so if you draw, uh, you know, along, so like a Y, like an X axis, if you will, the, the, this is diamond. You have the different successive you know, traders as well as invaders and different kinds of settlers. Would it be possible for us to make a chart where we say, all right, you know, pre-Muslim times, these would have been the places where horses would have come into mainland India as it was then. And then from the medieval times, it would mainly be from Persia or Arabia and then going into the British period. You know, I'm just trying to think of the imports of horses. In, in yes, two, two main routes that horses came into India, always from the west. Um, they came over the Himalayan passes. They came from Central Asia right straight. That must have been among the earliest. But at the same time, and from an early period, we have early records, horses came by sea to South India. Um, around the around the, the tip of India and also on the west coast, they landed in Goa. The Portuguese brought them into Goa, but people even before the Portuguese were in Goa, people landed in that part of India into South India. The South Indian kingdoms uh, imported them. So there are always two main routes: one overland and one by sea. Um, and they were used by different people at different times. Uh, Alexander the Great brought his horses in over the Himalayan passes and down into India, and uh, the, the the Persians, uh, the Mughals also came largely overland. But other horses from the Gulf state, with now the Gulf states, uh, the Persian lands came from sea. Um, there are all sorts of statistics of, of thousands and thousands of horses a year being brought in in both cases. Um, Although the Himalayan passes are high, they're not impassable for much of the year. It's dangerous to bring horses by sea because horses um, can't throw up. When they get seasick, they're very likely to get colic and die. So there were a lot of losses of the importing of horses by sea, which is one of the reasons why the British stopped bringing them down from England. There's too many of them died. But overland, it's better. But some survived. So yes, those routes though, of all those different centuries, different people kept bringing them in um, to the South Indian ports and now from, it's interesting because the, the mythology of horses in India, a lot of the stories are horses coming down from heaven. They come down to earth. And there's also a, a widespread myth of Arabian horses swimming ashore and fertilizing the mares, which is why so many of the Horses on the west coast of India have Arabian heads, that, that, that dished head and so forth. And indeed, if you think of the geography of India, horses did come from the skies. They came from the Himalayas. That's as high up as you can get. They came down as, from the as high as you can possibly get. Absolutely. As close as heaven as you can get. They came down from the Himalayas and they came out of the sea. They landed in the seaports of, of Goa and Madurai and, and so forth. So those myths of the horses from the sea and the horses from the air are in some ways based upon the, the true experience of the facts that horses in India always come from somewhere else. They don't grow primarily here. Um, we're coming towards the, the end of our session and we've got a few questions from the audience before that. Uh, you talked about the ritual even today in northern India where in marriage ceremonies in, in Hindu households the, the groom rides a mare and it's typically preferably a, a Marwari uh, yeah, mare. Yep. 
Right, right. And so that is definitely a ritual where the mayor, the horse itself, is front and center of that entire procession. Yep. But you also talked about experiences and, and the way that the culture is developed, where you have, let's say, the Pitora painter in Chota Udaipur, who is, who is diligently painting, and they're beautiful you know, elegant paintings on, on the walls of houses. But these people have had no practical or, or tactile experience of horses at all. Or, or uh, your first visit ever to India and to rural Bengal in Birpur near Shantaniketan, where you, you see the, the thatched mud houses and they have clay horses that are engraved and, and drawn yeah, in. Yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah, yeah. have never possibly seen a horse in their yeah. lives, let alone ridden one. Right. So, you know, is it fair to say that we've kind of come into an era where, you know, the, the ritual almost becomes an end in itself without, in, in, in the total absence of, of the horse. Right. And, you know, what's, what's, what do you think is the future symbolically, as far as the horse is concerned in going forward in Indian culture? So the people who never saw horses uh, saw pictures of horses. So the young man who's painting the Pitoro story has seen other Pitoro stories. And in a way, when we think of our own Western, um, I think of my own uh, European art tradition, you do Madonnas. No one has seen Jesus's mother for several thousand years, and yet people keep painting paintings of the mother of Jesus, the Pieta and the Madonna, from other paintings of the Pieta and other sculptures of the Pieta. So art has its own history. And yes. just as um, um, we have our histories um, in European culture, so too we have our histories in India of the way horses are painted, the way horses are sculpted. Artists know about other artists. So a lot of the paintings and images of horses are painted by people who saw other paintings and images of horses. So that's how they know where the legs go and where the tail goes and all of that. The idea that it's important to have image of a horse, that you should paint a horse on your house, or you should make a little clay horse and put it on the grave of your ancestors, is part of the enduring mythology of horses. And people have seen a horse here or there, or heard a story, or heard the history of India, or heard the tales, or have read the Mahabharata, or have heard recitations of the Ramayana. And the idea of the horse is still tied up with royalty, with divinity, with fertility, um, with power. I mean, we talk about horse power. Um, horses remain a symbol of power, maybe even especially for people who don't have horses. Look at them, they have that. Look how, we have nothing, they have everything. We'll paint our horses, we too will get what they have. So I think sometimes the absence of real horses is, is enhanced rather than wiped out the um, power of the mythology of horses in India. Just almost like the, you know, in a way, the, the subaltern's aspiration or wishful thinking then. Yes, yes. This is what we don't have. You know, um, there's a saying, if horses were wishes, all beggars would ride. And in India, you have the Kama Demu, a very important mythological, the, 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 the cow of desire. So you milk the cow and you said, I would like to have a Mercedes Benz, and you get a Mercedes Benz. You milk the cow, I would like to have a healthy child, you get a healthy child, and so forth. It comes out of the cow, that's the mythology. So I think you have a Kama, Kama Ashwa also. You have a horse of desires. If I paint this horse on my house, I will get into university. If I paint this horse on my house, my children will oh, stay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the quality, um, the quality of what you hope for and don't have, but you hope for. Indeed, indeed. But that's, that's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. We'll, we'll take up a couple of questions from the viewers. Uh, why don't we have Sarojesh's first? And while we're waiting for it to come up, uh, Wendy, this goes back to your point around horses coming in as as trade, you know, not just with the settlers, not just with the invaders, but 
through trade. And Saroji's question is that he's heard, he's read somewhere, that horses were brought into India in exchange for mainly Indian cotton and gold. Um, in, your, in your research, have you come across evidence of this specific kind of trade? Not for cotton, although I may just not have hit, hit that, but certainly for gold. Horses were uh, bought with gold. That was the primary exchange. And you have Marco Polo and all sorts of people, Indian sources as well, Tamil sources, telling you that a horse was worth 12,000 pieces of gold or 500 pieces of gold or enormous, enormous amounts of gold. That was the main thing. The Indian kings gave gold for the Persian and Arabian horses. That, that was the main medium of exchange, I think. Yes, yes. So if it's, so if it's hard gold, if it's bullion, if it's currency, as opposed to some kind of a barter system, you know, silk or spices or... I don't think it was barter. I think it was currency. When we're talking about kings, um, very few people could afford horses except kings um, in the ancient period. And they were bought for cavalry, for royal cavalry. And kings, having taken all the money from all their people, had lots of money. So that's where it went. The farmers gave the gave the crops and the money to the kings, and the kings then gave the money for the horses. So I think that's how it worked. Right. So we have another question, and this is from Parimal Negi. And he's saying this is not specifically about wicked mares or, or wicked stallions, but this is more around the, the iconography of of ladies um, riding on horses. And he says in the Indian tradition, particularly we're talking about pictures, paintings of Lakshmi Bai, uh, she is not riding side saddle, but she's riding the horse astride like a man. Whereas in the European tradition, many of the equestrian portraits that we see from medieval and Baroque times later on show the women sitting side saddle. Is there any reason why, you know, this choice would have emerged over time? Um, I think the simple answer is that the Indians were smart and the Europeans were stupid. Um, side saddle is just not a really good way to ride. Um, it's actually a very secure seat. Um, it doesn't look it, but it is. Um, you don't fall off. But if the horse comes down, you're in serious trouble. It's a very dangerous way to ride, really. Um, and also, it's, it's not as subtle. You can't do dressage side saddle very well. I mean, you have to have an extremely well-trained horse. So the question really is not why does Lakshmi Bai ride astride, but why do the European women ride side saddle? And that's a question I simply, I mean, it's obviously not nice to ride astride. It's like you're having sex with the horse or some stupid attitude toward women. So anyone with any sense, such as the Rajputs, let their women ride astride. And the, Raj, and the Rajput women in general had um, a, an active participation in government and uh, those Rajput women were something uh, to be reckoned with. And uh, they were not gonna be put at the disadvantage of riding side saddle the way the Indo-European women were. So that's my answer is here's, hearing, here's for Lakshmi Bai who did it right. And, and possibly, just sort of thinking aloud here, possibly it, it then has to do with the basic function or the utility of that particular stance. So, for example, if a European woman in the 18th or 19th, early 19th century is riding side saddle, the object of that, the purpose of that, is that it's it's either a pageant or the purpose is to be painted in that <laughs> format. Whereas when Rani Lakshmi Bai is doing it, she's riding into battle. She's she's fighting for her life and for her for her land. So obviously <laughs> not just you can ride side side. You can ride over fences side side. I mean it's it's not an impossible thing to do. I've done it. Um, you you can ride side saddle, um, but it's not as it's, you're not as as um, you don't have as, as as good command of the horse, as subtle command of the horse, and you don't have as easy use of your upper body as you would if you're riding and especially helping women. It's simply not as efficient. But you can ride fast and you can ride over fences side saddle. It's just not as good as riding a stride. Indeed. And we've just come to the top of the hour. Wendy, this has been absolutely fascinating. 
And, and you know, every single time I exchange an email with you, I learn something. And that is completely amplified, magnified. When I get an hour, a full hour with Wendy Doniger, um, hopefully we'll have many such more joyous occasions next year when you're I'm, I would love to come back again. This was great fun for me. It's, nothing is as much fun as talking about your books, and nothing is as much fun as talking about horses. So this was sh sheer pleasure for me. I thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, a big thank you to Tata Steel, Kolkata Free Meat, and everybody in the Game Plan team. And a big thank you to all our generous sponsors and partners who've made these events possible in these pandemic times. Um, we should be back again for another engrossing session very soon. Thank you. Until then, stay safe. Bye-bye.